Am I audible and visible yes. properly? Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Perfect. Good morning. Good morning, Professor Parker. Guten Morgen. How are you? Yeah, fine. We are fine. We are waiting for you. 
Right. <laughs> so, uh, yes, pleasure to be here. Thank you. Virtually. <laughs> yes. Jen, we'll start in a couple of minutes, okay. That's fine, no problem, I didn't know quite what, I'll leave it to you to. Yeah. It's nice to see um, uh, people attending on a Saturday morning. Yeah, actually we are open on Saturday also. Really, do, do you generally work on a Saturday? Yeah, yeah. Mm. Yes, Hello, well, Dr. that's Jen. Hello Dr. Jen, myself Padmini. See Sorry, director, madam. Hello, myself, Padmini. Padmini Swain, director and other day. Hello. Hi. Hi. Nice to see you. Thank you. Even we are very happy that uh, even your time is not matching, but uh, uh, you are uh, so uh, means uh, so interested to deliver the talk, and our scientists are also very eagerly waiting for your uh, talk. So you're, I think the model we should start. Yes, madam. In a, just another, in, in a minute, uh, we'll uh, start. Yeah, another one or two minutes, you just wait. Yeah. Okay. So, Dr. Amrita, I think you are ready. Yes, I'm ready, sir. Hmm. Just, uh, Good morning, we'll Professor start. Parker. Good afternoon, madam. Good afternoon. Should we start? One minute, wait. Just in a minute. Dr. Rathor, 
tell our other scientists to join tell over phone tell over phone maximum of your scientists have they should have joined मैडम पद्मिनी नमस्कार कौशलियर या थैंक यू वेरी मच यू हैव जॉइन डॉक्टर कौशल या अगेन कंग्रेट्यूलेशन आल्सो फॉर योर अचीवमेंट ओ थैंक्स 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 अ लॉट I think uh, Dr. Mandal, we can start. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Dr. Mita. Yeah. Dr. Jain, we are starting. Okay. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone, and a very good morning to Professor Parker, respected director of National Rice Research Institute, Dr. Padmini Swain. Today's guest speaker, Professor Jane Elizabeth Parker. research group leader from max planck institute for plant breeding research cologne germany all heads of the respective divisions and regional scientists the dignitaries from icar and other institutes students ladies and gentlemen on behalf of our institute i welcome you all on the 10th special talk under the being organized at national rice research institute आजादी का अमृत महोत्सव आजादी का अमृत महोत्सव and will end post a year on 15th august 2023 the mahotsav is dedicated to the people of india and will be celebrated as a people's festival in the spirit of people's participation the indian council of agricultural research is undertaking various activities in this regard and this include awareness campaigns and lectures by eminent personalities on the thematic areas for reaching out to maximum stakeholders in years of agriculture under icar umbrella national rice research institute is also organizing lecture series today we are delighted to have with us professor jen elizabeth parker research group leader from max planck institute for plant breeding research cologne germany to deliver this special talk on the topic plant immunity signaling paths from fundamental research towards application We are really honored to have you, Professor Parker, in this special lecture series. And Professor Parker needs no introduction. He is an eminent scientist in field of plant microbe interaction and immune responses. Our work involves isolating the genes which trigger innate defense mechanism and combines genetics with molecular biology to evaluate how plants are able to defend themselves from disease-causing microorganisms. Her group uses an array of approaches ranging from genetics to RNA sequencing, mass spectrometry, live cell imaging, protein biochemistry, structural analysis, computational final gen genomics, and evolutionary programming. So I know you all are very much eager to listen to Professor Parker. But before that, I would request Dr. P. C. Das 
head crop protection division and chair of the organizing committee of Ajadi Ka Amrit Mahotsav in Radhra to welcome Professor Parker and give a brief about to this program. Thank you, Amirdan. Good morning, Professor J. E. Parker and colleagues of Max Planck Institute for Plant Breeding Research and a good afternoon everyone in India. I take this opportunity to extend a warm welcome to Professor J.E. Parker, group leader, Max Planck Institute for Plant Breeding Research, Germany, albeit in virtual mode. On the occasion of a special talk series to celebrate 75 years of India's independence. I welcome our director, Dr. Padmini Swain, to preside the virtual function. Hearty welcome to all the dignitaries of ICR headquarters and other ICR institutes, head of divisions, and scientists of ICR NRI. Welcome to one and all to this virtual function. Madam, this is the 10th lecture in this series of special talks to celebrate 75 years of India's uh, independence, Ajadika Amarti Mahasya. The first lecture was uh, delivered by Dr. P. Chandrasekhar, Director General Manage Hyderabad on Agripreneurship Led Extension on 18th August 2021. The second lecture was uh, delivered by Dr. Uh, Professor Robert Henry of the uh, University of Queensland, Australia on topic genomics of wild and domesticated rice on 7th September 2021. Professor Yenung Yang of Pennsylvania State University, USA delivered the third talk on CRISPR Cas enable crop precision breeding and disease diagnostics on 7th December 2021. The fourth lecture was delivered by Professor Detlef Wengel of Max Planck Institute for Biology, Germany, delivered the uh, topic on mutation is a mutation is a mutation on 28th January 2022. Dr. Owen Singh, um, Vice Chancellor, Birsa Agriculture University, delivered the fifth lecture on intellectual property rights, retrospective and perspectives on 15th. February 2022. The sixth lecture was uh, delivered by Professor Dr. Carol T. Wood, Department Head, Plant Pathology, and the Director of Penn State Microbiome Center, Pennsylvania State University, USA. This, uh, that was the sixth lecture on translational taxonomy from micro, uh, microbes to microbiomes on 8th March. 2022. The seventh lecture was delivered by Professor uh, Jathan D. G. Jones, group leader, the Sainsbury Laboratory UK on dissecting and deploying plant immune receptor mechanism for crop protection on March 29, 2022. The eighth lecture was delivered by Professor K. Yala Reddy, Dean Faculty of Agricultural Engineering and Technology, Angar, Andhra Pradesh, India, on 30th May 2022. The last lecture, that is the ninth lecture, was uh, delivered by Professor Nick Talbot, the Sensory Laboratory, on uh, investigating the cell biology of a plant infestation infection by the rice blast fungus Magnapurtha oryzae on June 9, 2022. And in this series today, we are conducting the 10th one and uh, Professor J. A. E. Parker has kindly accepted our invitation to deliver this uh, lecture on plant immune signaling, signaling paths from fundamental research towards application. I welcome you all once again and to enjoy this special talk by Professor Parker. Now I am handing over the podium to Amrita Banaji for a further announcement. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Now I request Dr. Shudhamai Mandal, Principal Scientist and Member Secretary of this program of NRRI to present a brief introduction of Professor Parker to the August audience. Please, sir. Thank you, Dr. Amrita. 
Guten Morgen, Jen. It's my pleasure to introduce our special guest today, Professor Dr. J. E. Parker, to the August virtual gathering. Professor Parker is a research group leader at the Department of Plant Microbe Interactions, Max Planck Institute for Plant Breeding Research, Cologne, Germany, and Cologne Düsseldorf Cluster of Excellence of Plant Sciences, Düsseldorf, Germany. Coming to her academic degrees, she has very distinct distinction in her academic achievements. She received a Bachelor of Science first class honors in 1983 in applied biology from University of Bradford, UK. She then proceeded to receive her PhD in 1987 from the Department of Botany and Microbiology, University of Wales, Swansea, UK. Her professional activities are as below. Uh, from 1987 to 1990, Professor Parker was postdoctoral scientist in Max Planck Institute for Plant Breeding Research, Cologne, Germany. From 1990 to 1998, she did her postdoctoral research in the Science Very Laboratory, John Innes Center, Norwich, UK. From 1998 to 2001, she was junior group leader at the famous the Science Very Laboratory, or TSL. In 2001, she was basically a research group leader from uh, in the Department of Plant Microbe Inter Interactions, Max Planck Institute for Plant Breeding Research, Cologne, Germany. From 2004 to 2009, Dr. Parker was Max Planck Fellow, Max Planck Institute for Plant Breeding Research, Cologne, Germany. In 2009, she got elevated to Associate Professorship at the Institute for Genetics, University of Cologne, Germany. Now she is continuing as research group leader at Max Planck Institute for Plant Breeding Research, Cologne, Germany. Coming to the awards and membership, she has very prestigious awards to her credit. She was selected to Academy of Europe in 2017, to EMBO, European Microbiology Organization, 2016, she, elect, she was elected to the German National Academy of Sciences, popularly known as Leopoldina in 2013. She was a member of Max Planck Society C3 Independent Research Fellowship 2004 to 2009. She got the very prestigious Alexander von Humboldt Schofzger Kovaleskaja Prize in 2001. Also, she is a member of International Society for Plant Microbe Interactions and American Society for Plant Biologists. Coming to her extraordinary editorial works, she is on the editorial board of the prestigious Science Magazine from 2011 onwards. Still, she is continuing in that job. She is also the editorial board member of Trends in Plant Sciences, Current Opinions in Plant Biology, the Plant Journal Associate Editor, and Plant Physiology Monitoring Editor. Her other activities include ERC LS9 Review Panel, Starting Grants 2021 towards to till date. IS, International Society for MPMI, Molecular Plant Microbe Interactions Board Directors 2019 onwards. DFG Grant Review Panel, Plant Scientist 2016 to 2019, again 2020 to 2023. HFSP Postdoctoral Fellowships Committee 2010 to 2014. Then Principal Investigator CEPLAS 2. CEPLAS stands for Cluster of Excellence on Plant Sciences from 2018 to 2024. And she was coordinator for plant microbes in C plus one 2013 to 2018. And also she was in the steering committee of University of Cologne International Graduate School 2008 to 2012. Her contributions also include as grant reviewer for ERC, BBSRC, DFG, Genoc Plante, NSF, NIH, USDA, ANR, ANO, W, SFI, et cetera. Coming to the organization of work, she organized very high profile international symposia like 
CSHL Plant Genomes Conference 2015 to 2021, IPMB Congress Montpellier 2018, SFP 680 Symposium, Environmental and Biotech Interaction 2016, Cologne, SFB 670 Cell Death Inflammation and Immunity Meeting 2016 at Crete, NLR Biology in Plants and Animals Workshop 2015, Schloss. Ringberg, Germany, first joined MPI3 Symposium Colony in 2016. So she has kindly agreed with this kind of background. She has just kindly agreed to deliver this lecture to us on this um, day for, a, uh, um, for our Ajadika Amrit Mahotsav. Let us listen to her. Thank you, Dr. Amrit. Thank you, sir. So now it's time to listen to Professor Parker. I would like to invite Professor Parker for her special talk. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you very much um, uh, to, uh, for the invitation I, it, on this very special occasion, um, anniversary of uh, Indian independence for 75 years. Um, and so I appreciate it very much and I feel it's a privilege to, prevent, to present our work um, to you. Um, so I'll just share my screen. Do you see that? Yes, ma'am. Yes, fine. I'll just find the pointer. There we go. Um, so, uh, yes, um, since my postdoc time, I've been interested in how plants recognize and defend themselves against uh, microbial pathogens. And uh, so that was many, many years I started uh, looking at uh, this, this aspect of plant biology. And um, I was fortunate uh, in about, when I finished my PhD in about 1988, I was fortunate to, to be part of a wave of genetic analyses to unpick how plants uh, respond to, to pathogens. And I think that was in a very important phase in, in plant microbe interaction research where resistance genes were beginning to, to be uh, cloned and, and we were getting a better genetic underpinning to, to, to um, how plants resist uh, uh, disease. And so, but today I'd like to talk about some of our most recent research. And again, I think there's been another massive surge in the last five years, four or five years, in understanding how plants recognize pathogens and how that, that recognition is transduced to pathways that, that stop the pathogens from growing, which, which of course is very important to understand. And, um, at the Max Planck, we do mainly um, fundamental research. So, so, so the remit of, of Max Planck uh, Research Institutes is, is to, to do fundamental research. Um, but I think, and this is, this is the, the, why I've, I've made the title of this talk, I think there are so many opportunities now to consider how that funda fundamental understanding can be translated into potentially uh, useful applications for plant protection. And so, so I want to sort of touch on that and it, be, it might be a, a, a good point for, for discussion. So um, I just want to go back to some of the conceptual uh, models that we now have uh, in plant microbe interactions and plant pathology. And that's built up from data from many groups over many years. And that can be illustrated in this diagram here. So there are two main uh, recognition layers, machineries in plants in innate immunity uh, for defending themselves against various uh, attacking uh, pathogens. Of course, unlike animals, they don't have an adaptive immune system. So they rely on individual cells to be able to recognize danger, perturbations by microbes and then respond for survival. And so the first layer is governed by 
a large family of uh, pattern recognition receptors called PRRs for short. And those are very effective in a sort of broad resistance to uh, non-adapted or poorly adapted uh, microbes. So, so this layer stops growth of, of, of um, microbes by recognizing various uh, microbial associated or pathogen associated molecular um, patterns. Those microbes that have become adapted to new hosts, they do this by uh, producing effectors. And these are molecules that are either secreted into the plant cell or they can be secreted into the apoplast around plant cells. And their purpose is to dampen the machineries, quite often the PAMP triggered, uh, PRR triggered machineries, um, to gain access to the plants and then and then they can they can colonize further. Um, so dampening of the PTI, so pattern triggered immunity hub is a very important output of these effector proteins. They do other things as well. They can they can confer susceptibility in many different uh, ways. And then plants have evolved a an equally very large and diverse family of nucleotide binding leucine rich repeat receptors or NLRs for short, that uh, are expressed inside cells and recognize the pathogen effector molecules. And these can be either quite specific or they can recognize multiple um, effector molecules. And that recognition then triggers what we call effector triggered immunity, um, which normally, not always, culminates in a, a, a very highly localized cell death response. So there's a sacri sacrifice of the, of the host cells, um, a, a few host cells that allow the plant to then stop pathogen growth. This is a very effective and can be quite specifically activated resistance mechanism. Now, until fairly recently, these two layers of immunity were considered as separate entities and they were researched as separate entities. But recent work um, from, from a number of groups has shown that the, they cross potentiate each other. So there's, there's a lot of crosstalk between these two uh, machineries, these two systems. Um, and that crosstalk is important for uh, maximizing the resistance response. So I think that's an important finding um, in the field. So if I look more broadly now at these uh, intracellular receptors, so I'm just going to focus on, on this, this intracellular, this, this effector triggered immunity layer for a moment. Um, if we compare the architectures of the uh, receptors that we find and clone and functionally analyzed in plants, uh, they, they resemble uh, uh, immune, innate immune receptors that have been found also in animal uh, systems. Um, the, the big difference is that in plants, these sensor NLRs have expanded massively in number and diversified. And the reason for that is most likely because that's driven by pathogen evolution and pathogen pressure to, to evolve new recognition um, capabilities. But in essence, and this is shown very nicely in this diagram, the overall architecture and principle is the same in that in these resistance proteins, you have uh, 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 repeat domains, quite often leucine rich repeats, but there can be other repeat domains um, at the C terminus. And those are important for, for uh, quite often for, for recognition. And then you have the engine of the molecule, which is an ATP, ADP binding site, which, which creates the energy to, for a conformational activation of these proteins. And then at the end terminus, you have various uh, uh, N-terminal domains, which are the signaling uh, domains. So there is a very common architectural principle between animals and plants in, in, in these uh, NLR proteins. And I just wanted to highlight the two groups of sensor NLRs that have been found, major groups, broadly speaking, sensor NLRs in plants. The first group is called a tier NLR or TNL for short, and that has a toll interleukin-1 receptor domain. That domain has also, also important in animals for 
uh, as an adapter domain for connecting various uh, signaling proteins and also as part of the, the surface receptors. But it's only in plants that this ton interleukin-1 receptor domain, tier domain, is found in the architecture of these NLRs. The other subclass, major subclass of sensor NLR, are these coil-coil domain um, NLRs, or, or CNLs for short. So there are two major classes in plants that recognize pathogen effectors, and then they transmit that recognition to downstream uh, uh, defense pathways. And a big question in the field has been, how, is that, how does that activation then lead to downstream defense? And relevant to that, I'd like to, at this point, highlight a group of phylogenetically distinct, so distinct from these sensor NLRs, and quite conserved um, CC domain um, NLRs, which are not sensors, but they act in signaling downstream of some of these sensor NLRs. So these are called helper NLRs, or RNLs for short. And they have a somewhat modified um, um, coil coil domain that we call coil uh, CCR because this domain was first identified by Xun Zhao um, uh, uh, in a protein called RPW8, which is an important immune regulator that was character ca characterized in, uh, uh, in, in Arabidopsis. So, so this domain is important for the, the functions of these proteins. So I just wanted to highlight those, those different classes. Um, and then another point I think that we've learned from comparative analysis between plant NLR receptors and animal NLR receptors is that these proteins behave similarly as very tightly controlled molecular switches. And they become activated, and this is shown nicely in this schematic, by uh, an exchange of ADP for ATP, which then leads, together with uh, a perturbation by, for example, an effector or some molecule, um, into a conformational change, which then uh, creates an on state. And at the time of this review, it was not clear whether these were these these activated NLRs were, were oligomers or not that has become much clearer um, later um, but this emphasizes also the need in plants and also in animals there are various mutations in in animal NLRs that are important for the pro-inflammatory response against disease but um, uh, for example there are there are mutations in in human disease patients, which lead to a loosening of this tight control. So it's very important in plants and in animals that these proteins are kept uh, at a low level of expression in untriggered, so, so healthy uh, cells, but also very tightly um, inhibited so that they're not misfiring inappropriately. And you can see here the consequences of inappropriate misfiring in this famous um, uh, TNL, so tier domain NLR mutant. It's a single amino acid exchange in the nucleotide binding domain that was discovered by my colleague Chin Li at the University of uh, British Columbia in Vancouver. And they've, uh, her group have done extensive analyses of this autoimmune response. And that then uh, deregulates the, the uh, immune response. And you can see the fitness penalty that's associated with that. Uh, similarly, we've been studying with Ruben Alcazar in Barcelona uh, a phenomenon called hybrid incompatibility, so immune-related hybrid incompatibility uh, in Arabidopsis, uh, in which uh, one experiences in crosses between different genetically distinct accessions, then this appearance of, of autoimmunity, and this is due to a deregulation of the immune response due to a molecular incompatibility between genes or alleles in the two uh, parental lines. A very typical example it's, uh, showing different evolutionary paths for, the, for these lines. Um, and so the, the basic message here is that activation of these NLRs is very important for, uh, for conferring resistance. And I've talked about cell death, but equally this activation has to be very tightly uh, constrained. And I'd like to just go back to the work that was done by Harold Floor in the 1940s and 50s. And it was, it was 
an absolutely seminal uh, advance in our understanding of plant host pathogen interactions. So he studied mainly the interaction between uh, flax and flax rust fungal isolates. And from that analysis, purely genetic analysis, looking at segregation, inheritance of, of genes in the plant conferring resistance and genes in the fungus uh, conferring recognition, so, so uh, also resistance, that there was a, um, a gene for gene relationship in that there were corresponding pairs of genes in the host and the fungus that conferred the resistance response. And from that, it was predicted that there's likely to be some receptor ligand interaction. That, so that would be the simplest explanation of those that, that, of that gene for gene um, scenario. And indeed, so once these are resistance genes were cloned, um, it became clear that yes, in many cases, there is a direct interaction between the NLR and its recognized effector. And in fact, if you look at series of, of variants of the resistance proteins and the effectors, you can see evolution of recognition and uh, evasion of recognition playing out on the surfaces of these proteins uh, in, in the leucine rich repeat domains and, and the uh, effector binding domains. So that's a very beautiful illustration of how this, these, these uh, systems, the, the host pathogen interaction is very highly co-evolved. But it became clear that direct recognition is not the only way of, of, of triggering the response. And in many cases, there is an indirect recognition, by which I mean that the effector itself um, is not recognized, but it's, uh, its modification or perturbation of a host target is recognized by the NLRs. So the NLRs are seen as guarding various targets that are, that are uh, uh, targeted by the pathogen effector. So that's an indirect recognition mode. And it's now clear that some of those targets are major hubs in the defense uh, network. Um, uh, but they also, the plant in response has evolved decoy proteins that resemble the targets. They don't have the target uh, functionality but they, as it were, betray the presence of an effector that is attacking that target and then that, uh, uh, activating that, that NLR. And you can, you can imagine that if that target or, or its decoys are, are, are um, attacked by multiple um, pathogen effectors, um, then this increases the plant's capacity for, the, as it were, the radar system for recognizing a broader um, set of, of, of pathogen uh, effectors. So this is maybe one way in which the plant expands its repertoire for, for um, uh, uh, pathogen recognition. And I just want to mention some work that was spearheaded by Laurent Deland uh, 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 to uh, Toulouse, uh, INRA Toulouse, uh, together with, with, with my group a few years ago, that which illustrates the um, the activity of these, these uh, uh, decoy mechanisms. And this is, one this is one decoy which has become embedded in uh, an NLR, that it works as a pair in Arabidopsis. So these are tier NLRs or TNLs, a TNL pair that uh, operates in Arabidopsis to recognize multiple uh, pathogens. Um, and uh, some of the effectors have been identified that are recognized by this, this TNL pair. Um, uh, for example, a bacterial effector, so Pseudomonas effector AVRPS4, which is secreted into the plant cells, and that, that's recognized, as well as a, a POP-P2, which is produced by a, a very um, uh, infectious root pathogen, Ralstonia solanaceorum, um, which uh, produces a, a cetyl transferase activity, which is also recognized by this, this pair. And you'll note in the RS1, so this is the, the sensor NLR of this pair, that there's embedded in the C terminus a worky transcription factor DNA binding domain. Now, worky transcription factors are plant specific. They're a large family of plant specific uh, defense related transcription factors. And this DNA binding domain uh, mimics those of the, the transcription factors. And those transcri transcription factors are very important for orchestrating uh, the defense response. And so RS1 is bound to the DNA. 
and the activities of AVRP4 by binding to the worky domain or POP2 by transacetylating this worky domain perturbs its binding to the DNA and then that lifts the complex off the DNA and at the same time creates a conformational change that allows this, prote this protein pair then to trigger um, the TNL immune response. So this is a very nice example of, of a decoy domain being uh, really brought into very close proximity uh, to the, the activation sensor NLRs. And so put in another way, this, and this is sort of, uh, uh, this diagram is referring to POP2, which is the acetyl transferase. This effector, when it's not recognized, it triggers the, it, it uh, triggers the, the uh, uh, detachment of worky transcription factors. And in fact, it targets quite a number of these worky transcription factors. Uh, so that they can't transactivate uh, a defense genes and that leads to immunity suppression. Um, but if that POP2 acetyl transferase activity is captured by this uh, TNL pair um, that's bound to the DNA, that same detachment of the working domain from the DNA then activates the NLR complex and that leads to immunity activation. And so a potent effector is then converted into, into, a, into a, a, a resistance triggering uh, molecule. And if we look more broadly, now um, plant genomes are so much more accessible. So the sequencing revolution over the last five, 10 years allows uh, research groups to, to access uh, genome sequences of, of, of plants, even de novo sequences. Of, of plants beyond the models, um, even very large uh, uh, complex crop genomes. And it's clear now that once the NLRs uh, have been um, characterized and categorized, that many of them do have these integrated domains, not just the worky domain, but there are other um, uh, integrated domains. And this tells us um, two things. Firstly, this suggests that these domains are part of a uh, normal uh, effector target. So it, I think it highlights and, and points the way to, to identifying uh, new effector targets. Um, but it also um, gives us some um, coordinates for those embedded domains to be able to engineer new resistance proteins with expanded uh, resistance capabilities. And uh, I noticed, uh, I, I heard that Jonathan Jones, my colleague has, has given one of these uh, uh, seminars and I'm sure he has talked about uh, uh, this in, in detail. So I won't go into it in, in much detail, but I just wanted to highlight how now an understanding of the placement and the activities and the relationship for the, between these uh, decoy um, domains within NLRs is a powerful tool to be able to engineer NLRs that can recognize, for, for example, an expanded um, repertoire of, of pathogen effectors. And that now is being shown so that with a much fine, finer uh, knowledge of the, the architecture and what constrains these NLRs, NLRs, I think this is a real prospect for, for um, uh, engineering new uh, resistances against important uh, uh, pathogens that, that emerge continually across the globe. So um, I want to go back now to considering the, the biochemistry of some of these uh, uh, NLR recognition systems, because again, this is information that has emerged really only in the last few years. And it's, it's absolutely crucial for us to then think about how we can utilize these, these systems more for, for protection. And so here I show you, and this was published in 2017 um, by the group of Russell Vance. It was an absolute uh, step change in our understanding of, of, of these activated receptors. And what Russell showed was, again, there's a pair of, of NLRs. One is the sensor NLR called NIGHT5. And the activation of NIGHT5 by bacterial uh, 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 molecules then leads to an oligomerization that's seeded by the NIGHT5, uh, but then consists mainly of NULP4, it's, 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 it's uh, uh, associating NLR. And this produces this beautiful cartwheel uh, structure that's called an inflammasome. And it's known that the inflammasome 
creates then a surface, a scaffold for interacting with certain components, like, for example, pro-inflammatory caspase enzymes, that then uh, activates a cascade of, of uh, 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 signaling leaving, leading to the inflammatory response. Then uh, in plants, uh, close on the heels of, of this structure, um, Gigi Chai's group, um, identified the activated, actually the inactive and the activated uh, structure of a plant, Arabidopsis CNL, so this coil coil type uh, uh, NLR receptor called ZAR1. And you can see that the activated uh, oligomer, as shown here, has a, a sort of similar principle as what we see in the inflammasome, in that the N terminal signaling domains are brought into close proximity. Um, and that is essential for then the downstream signaling. Uh, the two type, two different TNL uh, uh, proteins, one Arabidopsis uh, TNL RPP1, um, but also tobacco uh, TNL ROC1, uh, the structure of the activated form was, was uh, published uh, by the group of Judy Chai together with, our, uh, with my group and Paul Schultz, who's the first group in science. And then the ROC one was published by uh, Brian Staskovitz's group in, in, in uh, University of Berkeley at the same time. And those, and I'm showing it just for RPP1, but the same structure is seen in, in ROC one. Uh, and that again shows that there's these, these N terminal domains, in this case, it's the tier domains are brought into an ordered scaffold that, that becomes exposed for, for signaling. So there's a common principle here between uh, plants and animals in terms of the activated NLRs then assuming these, these, these higher order structures. And some beautiful work done by Gigi and also his, his colleague uh, Jan Men Tzu in, uh, in uh, uh, cows in Beijing showed in plant cells as well as in in vitro or, or heterologous systems that the ZAR1 activated pentama, as shown here from a side view, um, it then exposes its very end terminal alpha helices and they make contact with the plasma membrane and form a pore with channel ion channel activity. And that, uh, put, that channel is permeable to calcium ions. And calcium ions, as you will know, are very important orchestrators of defense. So this might be a means by which this activated CNL receptor, after um, recognizing a pathogen effector, could autonomously, since this is all made of the, the receptor, could autonomously then start off a calcium signaling cascade or potentiate one uh, leading to um, a potentiated defense. So that's worth considering as to whether that's, that's that, maybe that's, that's all it is in terms of what's needed to, to potentiate the defense. The domains that are formed in, in the um, uh, TNLs, the tier domains that are brought together, are, have a very different activity. So it was found a few years ago that tier domains in plants and certain animal mammalian proteins have an NADase activity. So they can hydrolyze NAD+. And you can see here for this animal uh, uh, architecture of the tier domain and, the, and one example of the plant tier, that this depends on a key catalytic residue and, and uh, a catalytic environment of amino acids. So when that residue is mutated, <clears throat> then that tier domain protein or a tier NLR uh, does not have NADA's activity and it, and, it, and it does not trigger an immune response. In the case of tier proteins, I should highlight this, there are many tier proteins that are not tier NLRs that are expressed by plants. And uh, all of the evidence suggests that, that many of these, not all of them, many of them have an NADA's activity. And so this suggested that um, maybe there are NAD derived molecules that are important for uh, then the downstream um, signaling. And a number of uh, uh, putative molecules were certainly identified in vitro and, and some in vivo. Um, I just wanted to um, touch on the, what I think is, is, is quite an exquisite uh, illustration of how this NADA's activity is, 
is constituted in, in uh, tier NLRs, at least based on our understanding of the RP1 and ROC1 uh, 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 tetramer that's formed upon activation. And what happens is that the four tier domains assemble as two asymmetric pairs that are interacting in an, uh, sorry, two symmetric pairs that are interacting in an asymmetric manner. And it's that asymmetry that then creates this catalytic site for um, a substrate hydrolysis. And that then is essential for triggering, uh, in this case, this is, a, this is a sort of proxy for immunity. This is plant cell death response. This is tested in a transient assay system. Um, and the thinking at the moment is that although the tier domains, which are not part of this, this NLR, confirmation also have this activity. So they can also have NADA's activity, but it's probable that this uh, TNL tetrama forces these tier domains into having an NADA's activity that is particularly potent. So that sort of, as it were, strengthens that NADA's activity. And I mentioned that because in the last year, there has been a, a uh, an absolute um, wave of, of new information, exciting new information on the versatility of tear domains in plants and in animals and also bacterial, though I don't have time to go into that, but it's worth looking into some of the literature on, on bacterial tear uh, domains as well. Um, that they have um, these tear domains, depending on the way that they associate, can have various enzymatic activities. And this was shown very, very nicely by Gigi Chai's group, together with Paul schultz leesford and this was published this year in Cell. Um, so the NADAs of the TNL I've shown you is interacting in a particular way, that the, the two tier domains are interacting in a particular way. And that creates an NADAs activity and produces a suite of, of uh, small molecules, uh, nucleotide-based small molecules. There's an alternative activity in the presence of nucleic acid and an alternative conformation is formed, seeded by these, these, these nucleic acid molecules of tear domains. It's probably not associated with TNLs, that, that's at least the current data. And that then uh, produces a nuclease activity which creates through its substrate of nucleic acid, cyclic nucleotase synthase activity. And that cyclic nuclease synthase activity produces another set of molecules. So variants that um, again are, are, are newly identified in plants as immune uh, signaling uh, and general uh, stress signaling molecules. Um, and so, uh, the, the, the idea now is that TNLs and tier only proteins or tier, the various tier forms are able to produce a cocktail of small molecules, of nucleotide based small molecules. And the question is then how do those molecules trigger the defense response? And we know from a long uh, time that uh, EDS1, which is a non NLR protein, is a lipase-like protein is essential in plants for uh, these, these uh, TNL or tear triggered signaling to then uh, uh, trigger an immune response. So we're asking the question, how do these small molecules, if they are produced in vivo, uh, which particular small molecules could activate, for example, directly or indirectly the, the, the EDS1 um, signaling system? And on that note, um, uh, my uh, PhD student, uh, Oliver Johandras, uh, together with uh, a postdoc, Dimitri Lapin, um, teamed up with a PhD student in Kazenia Krasilieva's lab at UC Berkeley. And uh, Oliver uh, and his colleagues have, have um, been able to use genome information and hidden Markov modeling to categorize tier domains uh, and tier domain archi architect architectures and fusions with other domains. And I think this is very, very useful inventory now for us to ask the question as to whether all tiers are doing the same thing or in, what co in which context they, they have perhaps uh, uh, different activities. And uh, from the um, 
recent analysis, there are obviously ways in which we can test the different uh, production of small molecules by these, these uh, tier domains using uh, site-directed mutagenesis. Um, so just let me recap. There are two types of sensor NLR in plants, the CNLs and the TNLs. There are also, and I bring back these, uh, this group of, of RNLs, helo domain or CCR domain uh, signaling NLRs that are important for uh, the resistance response. And I've shown you data uh, or evidence that the CNLs based on ZAR1, uh, there's also another wheat NLR CNL that, that's uh, uh, being published, which shows a similar architecture. So this might be a general principle for CNLs that this creates at the plasma membrane a calcium permeable channel. And so that might be an autonomous way in which it orchestrates and potentiates uh, resistance. By contrast, the TNLs upon activation by effectors produce an NADA's activity through the uh, formation of a catalytic, uh, catalytic site in their, their tier uh, domains. They signal through EDS1, and the EDS1 family proteins. And we know from data from many different groups that they also signal through these, uh, at least in, our, in Arabidopsis. Uh, sorry, I, I should emphasize that a lot of the genetic uh, evidence for the, the signaling is, is done in Arabidopsis for obvious reasons. Um, they also require these, these RNL uh, uh, proteins. And the RNLs divide into two subgroups similarly, uh, uh, similar sequences, but distinctive in terms of their activities. One is the ADR1 subgroup and the other is the NRG1 uh, subgroup. And that becomes important for, uh, for our subsequent discussion. Um, and it was shown by the group of um, Jeff Dangle. So in this paper published in, in Science, Jack Uppertel, that an autoactive form of an RNL, NRG1, assumes a similar higher order complex as uh, the, the, the activated CNL. It's not known whether it's, it's, it's a pentamer, uh, but it, it, it looks as if it might be. And it also triggers calcium release uh, when it becomes bound to membranes. And so it's possible that these CNLs uh, are doing the same job as it were as the, the these these helper NLRs are doing the same job as the sensor NLRs. So that's that's a possibility that that needs uh, more exploration. But those downstream signaling NLRs, the RNLs, they need in some way the activation by TNLs and the EDS1 family to work. And so if I go into a bit more detail on these branches, and these have been, um, as I say, um, examined by analysis of multiple mutant combinations. And I think the picture is really very clear as well as molecular association analysis. Uh, in the most part, using the Arabidopsis uh, 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 pathways, um, but also uh, using uh, N-benthamiana as a proxy, as a transient assay system for analyzing protein-protein uh, interactions and downstream functions. So a combination of these two systems has been very, very useful in unpicking this, this, uh, these modules. And I'd like to just tell you a bit more about this. So um, we assume that there's a small molecule produced by an activated TNL or uh, tiers. So when tiers self-associate, they can produce these, uh, they have these NADAs activity. And in Arabidopsis, that then is can trigger resistance through one sub-pathway of EDS1 family proteins with one subset of uh, RNLs called the ADR1s. So the other pathway that could be triggered and the decision-making between these two pathways is not fully understood but I think we perhaps have some ideas, um, is the EDS is, 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 a, uh, interact, is a dimer formed between EDS1 and SAG101. Sorry, I should have clarified this. There are two exclusive dimers of EDS1. One is EDS1 pad four, the other is EDS1 SAG101. So this is in the entire EDS1 family. And in this case, the tiers or the TNLs feed through this dimer 
and a different subset of the RNLs called NRG ones. So these two pathways have different outputs in Arabidopsis. This particular pathway is very important for potentiation of transcriptional defense and resistance that stops pathogens from growing, at least from the analysis that, 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 that we and others have done. This other sub pathway or module is very important for the uh, TNL triggered cell death response. Um, and so it looks as if there is some discrimination between these, these pathways. Um, and we wanted to know at what level that discrimination uh, is. Um, and the different usage of different TNLs and tiers for these pathways, again, suggests uh, that, that they are distinct. And in fact, the components of these pathways are non-interchangeable. So there really are distinctive uh, uh, co-functions. And we were able to show that in um, pathogen triggered tissues, um, and also this was shown by Chin Li's group, that EDS1 PAD4 specifically associates with ADR1 RNLs. So there's an induced complex formation in response to the pathogen uh, 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 TNL or tier trigger. Whereas EDS1 SAGOR 101 selectively preferentially interacts with the NRG1s. And so that genetic co function and uh, non uh, interchangeability that we see um, uh, is, is uh, mirrored in, in molecular uh, uh, preferential associations for these two different outputs. And then if we look at the structure of EDS1, SAG101 and EDS1 PAD4 uh, dimers, you can see that they're very similar. Um, so this was, this was uh, resolved by Stefan Wagner in 2013. He, he, uh, he resolved the structure of EDS1 and SAG101 and then from that we modeled EDS1 PAD4. Um, and you can see that the two lipase domains, so I, I mentioned these are lipase-like proteins, uh, uh, interact uh, in, uh, in the two complexes in a similar way. And this is, this is uh, dominated by this hydrophobic helix in EDS1 that fits into similar pockets of SAG101 and PAD4. And so that probably explains the exclusivity of these, these dimers. But we know from, from uh, site-directed mutagenesis um, that it's likely that this, this uh, lipase domain is acting as a non-enzymatic scaffold to bring these two uh, uh, proteins together. So it's not a catalytic uh, domain that's important. Um, and that then brings in the both pairs, the two uh, dimer, what we call EP domains together. And we know, for, again, from structure-guided uh, uh, mutagenesis, that it's these EP domains in both dimers that are essential for the downstream signaling and for the association with their respective um, helper NLRs, ADR1s in this case and NRG1s in this case. So it looks like the EP domains are the, the, the crucial uh, domains uh, within each pair uh, for the uh, signaling downstream of, of TNLs and tiers. And I won't go into the, the the, the uh, details of the data, but there's extensive analysis now based on structural guided mutagenesis of EDS1, PAD4 in a conserved surface that's produced by the dimers, also SAG101, similar but non-identical surface, which um, shows that there's a positive, um, generally conserved positive surface in these, these uh, proteins. And that surface intact, is required for their respective associations with the RNLs. And this was tested by uh, immunoprecipitation and, and mass spectrometry um, uh, to identify uh, peptides that are interacting uh, in, in a native context with, uh, of our Arabidopsis proteins. And so we come to this model that I show here, that the TNLs, presumably through a small molecule, then can activate either EDS1 PAD4 or EDS1 SAC101 branches, modules, and it's the amino acid surfaces that are distinctive, but similar, but, but uh, non-identical in these two pairs that then confer their interactions with the respective uh, RNLs and the downstream um, uh, signaling. 
uh, response. And so the pathway specificity to some extent can be explained by, by these EP domain surfaces. And so we have this notion that, that this, this, these, these um, modules of EDS1 pad four with ADR1s and EDS1 SAG101 with, uh, with, with NRG1s is acting downstream of the TNLs or the tiers. And my colleague Gigi Chai then asked the question, well, could we reconstitute that activation system in insect cells? because we were interested in seeing what the, whether there was a direct interaction and whether there were small molecules produced by the tears and TNLs that then, that then are instrumental in, in, in triggering the induced association, which was a marker of the activation of these two modules. And so Gigi's uh, team set about doing these insect cell expression assays. And it's an incredible feat because they were expressing uh, in the first instance, RPP1, which is a TNL, together with its recognized effector, together with one or other of the EDS1 dimers and one or other of the uh, uh, RNLs. So that's a lot of <laughs> proteins to co-express in, in one particular uh, um, complex uh, um, system, heterologous system. And what they found was, and this is, and you can see the result is very clear here, and this is in the case of um, co-expressing a GST tagged uh, isoform of ADR1 together with EDS1 pad 4 and then triggered then by this, this TNL activated system, that that induces the association between EDS1 pad 4 here and ADR1. It does not induce the association of ADR1 with EDS1 SAG101 that are, are co-expressed. And that tells us that in the insect uh, uh, system, that this uh, selectivity for ADR1s for EDS1 pad 4 is maintained, that we had seen in the plant system. So this specificity is maintained in, in, uh, in the insect cell system. And it also tells us that this interaction, this induced tier dependent interaction is, is uh, likely to be physical, direct. And you can see another control here in which uh, we've used the uh, catalytic uh, NADA's mutant of RPP1, and there we don't get this association uh, with uh, EDS1 and PAD4. So this is induced association depends on the tier uh, domain, RPP1 tier domain catalytic activity. Um, and so we, we put together a, a sort of scheme, a model, and then um, where we have this activated TNL producing a small molecule, we didn't find interactions between the TNL or the, uh, the effector protein with uh, ADR1, suggesting that it might be a, a, a sort of distal uh, small molecule. So that was, that was encouraging. And then Gigi took the purified uh, EDS1 pad four, uh, and then uh, uh, got the protein, denatured it by, by boiling, and then extracted a polar um, extract and a non-polar extract, and then analyzed and purified peaks by uh, uh, liquid chromatography mass spectrometry. And what they found was that indeed there was a peak that was uh, generated by the, the active form of the TNL, which could be purified from EDS1 uh, pad four. And when our colleague Jim Bao Chang in uh, Henan University was able to synthesize that molecule, so make a chemical analog of that molecule, and we used that in this induced heterologous <coughs> assay, then that could recapitulate this uh, induced association of EDS1 pad four with ADR1. And so that suggested that we had identified the molecule that binds to EDS1 pad 4 that's NAD derived or it's NADA's activity derived that then induces this association with ADR1. It did not induce the association with EDS1 between EDS1 SAG101 and, and NRG1, suggesting that this molecule is specific for this particular um, uh, module uh, function. And if we look at the molecules now, so these, these were the, from a structural analysis done by Gigi's team, um, 
uh, on the on the uh, activated EDS1 Pad4 complex and 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 EDS1 SAG101. We can see now that this pathway specificity could be explained at least in part by the binding of these dimers uh, to distinctive NAD derived molecules. So for EDS1 Pad4, it looks as if there are two related sets of uh, phosphorimase ADP AMP molecules that are specifically interacting at the, uh, the EP domain surface that we predicted should be uh, a, a positive surface for, for binding such a molecule. The, the precision of this interaction suggests that it's very highly specific. And that interaction within the dimer then sort of buries the molecule and, and protects it uh, uh, from, from what we think is, is rapid degradation. By contrast, the EDS1 SAG101 uh, dimer um, that is able to interact with NRG1 binds to a different set of NADAs uh, molecules. This is a very interesting potential enzymatic scheme, again, mediated by the NADA's catalytic site. Um, and that is an ADP ribosylation reaction um, on substrates of NAD, uh, which could be associated also, which are associated also with ATP. And that produces ADP ribose ATP conjugate or uh, a dimer of ADPR. And both of those molecules are able to bind into this, this um, cavity of EDS1 SAG101. It's interesting that. Um, the biochemical uh, possibilities of production of these two molecules through an, uh, a ribosylation uh, reaction um, could then be uh, generate molecules which could then be hydrolyzed to produce these sets. And so, um, although we don't fully understand the the, the, the um, catalytic processes. It looks as if there might be a dynamic of production of these molecules then leading to, to these molecules. And that's something for that needs much more um, research. Right, I'm going to finish um, very, very soon. Um, and so just to explain to you what the activation mechanism is, because the structures that uh, Gigi generated and his team generated together with the, the isolation of the molecules, um, gives us a very clear view of how this binding, and I show it just for EDS1 pad four, how this binding of a specific small molecule then um, creates a, an allosteric change in the C terminus of pad four, a similar change we see in SAG 101. And that change then creates a surface. And we don't know exactly what that surface is that interacts then with its specific co-functioning RNL. But there's, a, there's clearly a conformational change and quite a shift actually in some of the EP domain alpha helices um, uh, to create um, a, a binding surface for its RNL. And that interaction then is absolutely crucial for the downstream uh, signaling. And I wanted to highlight here, because this was in vitro analysis of certain structure guided mutants of EDS1 and PAD4 that was done by some stu uh, students uh, in, in Tsinghua University. And uh, it, it, it tallied really beautifully with our in vivo uh, functional data for EDS1 uh, PAD4, and the same goes for EDS1 SAG101. So it looks as if these in, these, these in vitro um, requirements are recapitulated and they parallel what we see in, in plants. But one thing which I haven't shown, and it was it, we realized it was absolutely crucial for us to, to show, um, was that all of the analyses that I've described to you have been done in an insect cell system in vitro. Clearly, there are molecules produced by insect cells that can be catalyzed by, NA, by tier NADAs that then bind to EDS1 pad 4 But could we identify these molecules in plants? Um, and that proved to be extremely difficult because um, the molecules, and, and we with the pure compounds, we found that, that these molecules get very rapidly degraded. And so we postulated that if these are really important second messengers, then maybe it's quite logical that they are degraded in the absence of, be, of binding to their receptors. And so what Wen Zong and, and Henny Lessler did 
um, was to um, activate plant tissue extracts with a tear trigger. So in this case, it's just a tear only uh, protein. And then pure, and then add into those extracts recombinant EDS1 pad4, which we have pure large amounts of. And the idea was that then to, well, if there is a plant produced small molecules, then maybe that can that can capture that small molecule and then we can purify it with the, uh, uh, we can extract it from this recombinant protein. And that succeeded. So that recombinant protein in large amounts added to these plant extracts that have been triggered, and this is shown here, uh, showed that plants produce P ribose AMP as an example with wild type tear protein, but not with the catalytically inactive tear protein. So this gave us confidence that actually these are natural plant small molecules. They're likely second messengers a new set of, uh, of second messengers, they have not been seen before in plants, that very specifically activate uh, immune receptors, which turn out to be these lipase-like uh, uh, dimers that then allow the, the resistance response to, to ensue. And um, I think it's, it's extremely exciting uh, that we now have the prospect of, of understanding better and perhaps modifying these small molecules to be able to turn on these, these modules because these two modules between them account for quite a lot of the resistance response. They're at a convergent point. They're conserved between different plant species. And so maybe there's a way of bypassing the, the um, uh, specific recognition and then activating this system in, in different ways. And so that's something that we're, we're interested in. Okay, so I will finish off. This is the model. We have the TNL resistance uh, or a tear protein, NADA's activity. In the case of uh, 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 one set of molecules, P ribose, AMP, ADP, but we have another set that I've indicated to you. Uh, in this case, this is binds specifically to the EP domain of this dimer, EDS1 pad4 dimer. That then creates a conformational change that allows stable interaction between the dimer and these helper NLRs, and then the, 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 the function of this, this uh, 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 complex is, is to uh, trigger the immune response. There are many questions remaining. For example, um, is the small molecule dimer binding sufficient for defense induction in vivo? So in the in vivo induction, are there other cues that are required? That's something that we, we really need to, to investigate. And what's the nature and the functions of these uh, uh, generated complexes? We don't know uh, what, what, the, what the topology of those complexes are. That's important to establish uh, how they are actually functioning and, and whether, whether these RNLs really are calcium channels, for example. Um, a, a very important question is how conserved are these uh, mechanisms across plant species? And, and we're, we're doing a number of analyses, and, and particularly I like to highlight this comparative analysis between Arabidopsis, uh, a model dicot, and rice, a model monocot. And uh, I didn't mention it because I didn't really have time, but the, the dicots have these tier NLRs and tier domain proteins, whereas the monocot uh, uh, crops do, do not have the tier NLRs, uh, they've lost them, uh, the monocots, but they do have tier domain uh, proteins. So an important question is then, what are the activities of those tier domain proteins and how do they, they, do they relate to the presence, conserved presence of these EDS1, PAD4, ADR1 um, proteins that we find in monocot genomes? Another question is, uh, we found two sets of tier derived small molecules that are bioactive and interact directly with these, these uh, lipase-like proteins. Um, are there other bioactive uh, tear-generated small molecules? Um, uh, again, I refer to some of the analysis in bacteria, um, as well as what I think will come out in plants is that, that there are probably other um, uh, active um, uh, small molecules generated. Um, and of course, what are the downstream outputs? So I will finish there and I'd like to, to thank uh, all of the people that have been involved in, in the work from the, the early analysis through to the, to the most recent uh, analysis. Um, uh, and in particular, my past members of the group, Deepak Bandarai, 
uh, Yoram Dongas, uh, Dimitri Lapin, and Ching Wazan, uh, excellent junior scientists who have, have, have made some absolutely crucial contributions to, to our understanding of, of these uh, pathways. And then um, more recently, the work together with Gigi Chai and his group, um, and Gigi is associated with the Max Planck. We're very lucky to have him here as a, as a, as a colleague, and we teamed up uh, uh, to, to be able to tally the in vitro with the in vivo uh, uh, work very nicely. Um, and his colleagues at Tsinghua University, in particular, two uh, absolutely outstanding students, Shijia um, Huang and Alon Jia, um, uh, at Tsinghua University, who who uh, who did who made the reconstitution and, and analysis in in uh, insect cell systems. I'd like to also acknowledge Chumba Chang at Henan Normal University, um, who who is an organic chemist who synthesized uh, some of the the small molecules that we could then test for um, for verifying their identity. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Rory Pruitt and Thorsten Nuremberger, who uh, collaborated and are still collaborating um, with Federica Locci uh, in understanding much better where some of these complexes that I've, I've uh, described to you, where they fit in this intersection between PTI and ETI. And I think it's interesting that they, they are probably working in the middle of this uh, at some point. Um, and Joanna Feehan and Jonathan Jones, uh, that we've been working uh, together with Ching Wazan and uh, Jun Li Wang um, on uh, the, the, the higher order complexes that are being produced uh, um, in, uh, in these uh, EDS1 RNL systems in, in a native uh, Arabidopsis uh, context. And uh, Oli, uh, I mentioned, has done this tier phylogeny analysis. Um, Jun Li, Henrietta and Juliana contributed to, to the analysis that, that we um, that I've described, which is this, this uh, in vitro analysis and, and in vivo uh, comparison of the small molecules together with Gigi's group. Thank you very much. Thank you. Shall I stop sharing now or? We'll take uh, a couple of questions, if uh, you permit. Sure, yes, be happy to answer. Uh, thank you, Professor, for this elaborate and informative presentation on plant immunity signaling, and particularly NLRs. And I'm sure uh, audience, they are eager to interact with you. So now we have 10 minutes for interaction. Uh, I request the audience to part and participants in the uh, participant in the discussion. Uh, either you put your question in the chat box or you can raise your hand. Then one by one will come. Uh, until now, I haven't received only Dr. Shudhamai Mondal have posted one question. So I'm requesting Mondal sir, you directly interact with Professor. Yeah, thank you, uh, Zen. It was a wonderful lecture and very informative with, uh, I mean, rich information and very uh, rather high profile presentation. Uh, actually, I went through your uh, 2020 science paper uh, where I just, uh, I mean, happened to see that uh, uh, basically um, uh, no NAD plus substrate was detected in that paper. Paper. So, uh, how my, my, my question is how the TIR NADH activity activates the downstream signal, immunity signaling? I, I, I got a bit of background, but I, I think I understood your question. So, your question was that in the, the TNL structure, yeah. the, the NAD was not found in this the structure. Yeah. site. That's a, that's a really good question. Thank you. Um, Actually, instead, we found ATP um, in the structure, and we were confused by that. Uh, but it was very clearly, so Gigi's analysis, it was a high-resolution analysis, and it was ATP, it was not NAD. Um, and we think we understand that better now, because... And this is this is published in the the bioarchive papers that that uh, uh, preprints. Um, the catalytic process 
uh, we thought was a hydrolysis, NAD hydrolysis. Actually, it looks as if at the catalytic site, there is there can be two substrates. There can be ADPR and ATP. So there's a probably a quick conversion of NAD to ADPR that then together with ATP that's bound by those tiers can be uh, ribosylated into, uh, in the case of uh, ADPR without ATP, um, di-ADPR, and in the case of ATP, then uh, ADPR, ATP, which are those two molecules which associate with the EDS1 Sagoron complex. So we don't understand the catalysis completely, but from the profiling of the molecules and predictions of how those, uh, those molecules could be, those chemistries could be uh, made, that looks like it could be a, a, a path to production of these, of, these, uh, of these molecules. It also says that these, there are probably other variants um, that are, are produced and, and we can't rule out that some of these small molecules are, are hydrolysis products of cyclic ADPR, for example. Um, so there's a, probably a cascade, a cocktail of molecules that are produced. And we really don't understand um, the dynamics of those molecules because, as I say, in plant cells, they, at least the ones that, that we've been interested in, are, are very difficult, well, impossible to capture because they're degraded unless they're bound to their receptors. Okay, thank you. Does that answer your question or does it? Yes. Okay. Yes. The next question from uh, Dr. Senjiva Rao. Uh, Madam, please give some information on how the plants can differentiate self and non-self. Um, well, they, it, it depends on the non-self. <laughs> so the non-self um, and, and those pathogens that cause diseases are ones that have overcome some uh, surface recognition layers um, that, that, that recognize their presence and, and, and uh, induce a, a, a resistance response. Um, so if the non-self is uh, from a non-adapted microbe, then that's sufficient, usually sufficient to stop that microbe from, from uh, 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 colonizing and, and exploiting the plant. Um, the effectors that are produced by host adapted pathogens, so those are ones that have managed to get over that first layer, and then they produce these effectors to manipulate the plant cells. That's also non-self. Um, and those are recognized by the NLR receptors. So, so in this evolutionary uh, relationship, can recognize. Um, so non-self um, can come in many different forms. Does that? Oh, there was a, there was a chat there. Shall I look at the chat? Yeah, please. You can take the yeah, question. Please. Yeah, is that okay? Uh, let me have a look. Can I ask a question, Professor Jean? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, guten Tag, Pro Professor Dr. Parker. Guten Tag. Yeah, the good evening. Thank you. Um, I'm, uh, I think uh, actually the Max Planck Institutes are supposed to be the highest order knowledge centers in Germany and world over. And your talk was standing to it. I appreciate it very much. Thank you very it much. It's a really scientific work. component. And I'm lucky enough to be have visited your institute way back about 30 years ago. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So you my would have known Jeff yeah, I was a dad fellow, and during that time I visited. My question is, you talked about the Wilkie transcription factors. 
Yes. Uh, Virki transcription factors are more worked out in abiotic stress tolerance mm -hmm. as compared to the abiotic mm -hmm. stress tolerance. So does it mean to say that the resistance factors, whatever we are talking of, they are between resist, uh, biotic and abiotic factors? And if that is say, if that is the case, then in case of your RRS1 and RPS4 combination receptors, how far that will influence the abiotic stresses? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. I, yeah, thank you uh, for your kind words. And, and it's, that, that's a really interesting question. Um, it's true that um, some of these components are also important for abiotic stress. And I think it depends on the way that, and the, the, the types of workies that are induced. And actually some very nice analysis being done by Saijo, um, God, I, should, I can't remember his name, <laughs> that's terrible. Um, anyway, it's published as a, um, but also other groups. It's, this question about the balance between biotic and abiotic stress, and certainly the workies, are very important in Arabidopsis uh, and, and I think in rice for this, this crosstalk between these two stresses. Um, it's becoming clearer that there are immune specific responses and there are more general danger stress responses. And uh, some of the immune, so once, at least this is my pitch on it, once the immune res specific response is tuned by, for example, TNLs or CNLs into a uh, pathogen resistance pathway, that generally antagonizes abiotic stress responses. So when it becomes, there's a point at which it becomes specific for the immune response. But before that, the space, and actually some of the small molecules, for example, these two, three C NMPs that are, are, are direct, that are produced by tears, um, there is space uh, for there to be an induction of abiotic or general stress. It would be general danger into which abiotic stress would fit. And so there, there's clearly a broader activity of tears in general stress um, compared to pathogen specific biotic stress. And I think that's very, very important for us to, to disentangle and ask which molecules produced by the tears are important for abiotic stress or abiotic plus biotic versus biotic stress. Thank you. Uh, as an extension, probably, can you can we take something like osmotin gene or MTLD gene? They are known to impart drought tolerance, salinity tolerance, as well as disease tolerance, osmotin gene. Yes, yes. Whether they produce these small molecules and does it really fit into the scheme what we are talking of? Yeah. If it yeah. can be checked, I think probably that will be the proof of the pudding. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the proof of the pudding, yes. Um, I think you're right. I think we have to look, and, and I think you mentioned ADR1. So overexpressed yeah. ADR1. and osmotin. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So I think uh, you're right. We need to, uh, identify what so so what I think these small molecules are obviously um, intersecting with uh, a number of different pathways and what's important is under these different uh, elicitations and stresses we need to see what the um, the, the the range of small molecules uh, that are produced and you know how they are then um, interacting with downstream components. And I think that, you know, so for the, for the, for the small molecules that, that uh, Gigi identified in the, re, the insect cell reconstitution system, those are clearly specific and absolutely dependent on the EDS1 RNL uh, uh, pathways. Um, but there are other small molecules that are not. Thank you.
Thank you, Professor. So next question from Dr. Mrinal Shamanta. Uh, uh, he asked that, is there any role of the damage associated molecular pattern in activating the plant NLRs? And moreover, is there any work understanding the role of structural chimera of the plant and animal human NLRs? Um, so the first question, the damps, um, it's not terribly well understood, but I bet there is. <laughs> so, so I think the cross potentiation that's now known to operate between NLR systems and surface recognition systems um, is, is, is much, is clear now. So, um, and those surface recognition systems, certainly some of them are recognizing um, even plant produced, so damp, danger associated uh, molecular patterns. There's probably recognition of damps also inside cells. In animal systems, that's, that's prevalent. That's very, very clear. In plants, that's less clear. I wonder if some of these nucleic acids that are then uh, that I mentioned are, are by us sort of acting as substrates for these tear molecules are actually damps. Uh, we don't know the answer to that question, but it, it's very likely that there are damps produced inside cells as well as in the apoplast that are important for um, potentiating either the general stress response or, or the, and, and some of that general stress response will of course be uh, effective against, uh, against uh, microbes. Um, the second question about chimeras, um, there was a study and, and, it's a, and it's a very interesting one that was done by Jonathan Jones in collaboration with uh, Russell Vance, where they hooked on, um, Tear domains onto a uh, tear domains of a plant NLR onto a an animal um, NLR module. I think it was milk four actually, which I remember. So it's one of these inflammasome components, and they found that activation of the NLR four module, so the the, the 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 activation system, which would be conferred by the leucine rich repeats of the NLR four was able to then trigger a tear generated downstream response, um, which is kind of interesting and that and, and produce small molecules, uh, uh, some of which will be bioactive, some, some not. Um, so that's the only one I can think of at the moment where there's been this, this uh, analysis of chimeras and that was an informative one. Um, I expect there's been, I mean, certainly, making of chimeras, even between NLRs that all come from plants, is uh, in the early days, a lot of that work was done, but it was not uh, very productive because we didn't understand the um, coordinates that are needed, the interfaces within the protein that are needed um, for constraint of that protein. So a lot of those chimeras were either inactive or they were autoactive, which wasn't so useful. Um, I think now there's so much more information about how these NLRs, um, uh, how the molecules are, are, are inhibited as well as selectively activated that I think that's more promising. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, and the last question from Dr. J. Sridhar. Uh, are plant NLRs pathogen or paste or stress specific? Any master molecule to combat multiple pathogens or pastes or stresses? Um, I mean, certainly NLRs are not necessarily pathogen specific. So there are groups of NLRs uh, that, uh, and I hopefully that I kind of illustrated that with the RS1. Um, RPS4 system. So they, they can recognize, so different effectors produced by different pathogens. So Alstonia is root infecting, Pseudomonas is leaf infecting, can converge on this recognition system. Um, there are, there are, I think there's increasing information of 
about NLR networks and um, co-functions between NLRs. And I didn't mention there are other set of helper NLRs that have been discovered um, and analyzed uh, in, in solanaceous plants, the NRCs, which are acting to downstream sort of in a partially overlapping man manner uh, for surface receptors and also intracellular receptors to then to orchestrate the resistance response. So those are, those are certainly uh, important intermediates. Um, there, there are, I, I'm trying to think of uh, examples where a sensor NLR uh, being triggered by a pathogen then induces a, a general abiotic stress response. In the most part, once those NLRs are triggered by a pathogen effector molecule, then they are more specific for biotic stress. But if you know of examples where that's not the case, I mean, I know of one where, for example, um, a root express TNL protein called Victor, when that's activated, it, it very clearly, or activating of particular isoforms of that uh, 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 TNL, then that dampens, that leads to a dampening of the abiotic stress response. And that's probably part of this prioritization. You know, if you're being hit by a pathogen, uh, you want to uh, respond very effectively to, to disease. If you are being um, hit by abiotic stress, you will turn on the systems for that. Uh, there are examples, so, so um, uh, Yusuka Saijo, this is my colleague, I forgot the, the, the surname, Yusuka Saijo, he's been doing some, and he and others have been doing some nice experiments where, you, where he does a co um, elicitation of abiotic stress and biotic stress. And I think that will then uh, allow us to, to identify key compo components in that, that sort of general um, stress responsiveness. I think to add to that uh, point, what you mentioned at the end, it's all about the energy distribution system the plant adopts to where to spend energy, where not. So that prioritization will, for the same gene, it can produce an NLR for abiotic stress if it says that that's more important than the disease, then it can happen vice versa too. Yes, Thank you. yes, yes, absolutely. And when there's not enough nutrition, then the plant is clearly geared to getting nutrition rather than defending. <laughs> yeah. Uh, thanks a lot, Professor, for your wonderful talk and interaction with the participants. Uh, and if no more questions uh, there, so now going, going ahead with the program schedule, it's time for the presidential address by Dr. Padmini Swain, Director, National Rice Research Institute. Madam, please. Thank you, Amrita. Thank you very much. Actually, a wonderful lecture we had. So I have nothing to address, but uh, as a customer, I will say a few words. Uh, really, it is a, a very excellent time, Professor uh, uh, Jane. Thank you very much uh, for your wonderful talk on plant immunity signaling paths from fundamental research towards application. Mm. So thank you I also so thank yeah I also thank all the dignitaries who have joined scientists of our institute, colleagues from different institutes, uh, students, technical staff, uh, those who have joined virtually to this very important lecture today. I could see around 100 participants from more than 13, 14 institutes of ICR and other organizations have joined. And also some dignitaries have joined. It is really very interesting day and uh, interesting lecture also today. And uh, Dr. Professor Jain has made it so enlightened. So I again profusely thank you. Uh, as a customary, just to say that a lead commentary in science in December 2020 captioned enzyme formation by immune receptors under plant immunology section, uh, referring to classic papers on mechanism of plant immune receptors. One of the paper was authored by you, Professor Jane, and your group. Uh, but that was on direct pathogen induced assembly of an 
NLR immune receptor complex to form a halogen. The plant immune system deploys two interconnected receptor layers, which detect microbial molecules of host damage signals and trigger resistance to disease. Panels of plasma membrane anchored pattern recognition receptors, including receptor like <laughs> kinase and receptor like proteins, activate a basal resistance response called pattern triggered immunity. You have already told, which is often sufficient to prevent the invasion by non or poorly adapted microbes. Inside cell, NLR receptors sense activities of virulence factors that are delivered into host cells by adapted pathogen strains, often to disable PTI. NLR effector recognition leads to effector triggered immunity, which frequently culminates in host localized cell death, that is hypersensitive response. The, there has been a surge of new informatic information over the last three years on the biochemical process underpinning PRR and NLR activation and downstream signaling. PRR trigger early defense to limit microbe colonization and NLR provide a mechanism to reinstate and uh, transcriptionally amplify PTR related defense that are breached during infection. Hence, PRR and NLR converse on qualitatively uh, similar transcriptional and metabolic output such as NADPH oxidase generated reactive oxygen species calcium iron flux, ion fluxes, mitogen activated protein kinase cascade and stress hormone networking reprogramming. The latter often lead to boosted salicylic acid defense. A recent studies in Arabidopsis shows that these two receptor layers potentiate each other to strengthen the immune response and therefore should be viewed more as interlinked barrier to disease than separate entities. When we consider some of the new waste physiological, biochemical, and molecular insights to signaling in ETI and its connectivity to PTI, a clear picture emerges of uh, intersecting defense pathways downstream of pathogen receptors activated in different cell compartments. Uh, I hope Professor uh, Parker, Jane Parker has very elaborately and very um, nicely she has explained and uh, delivered a very excellent lecture which enlightened us all on the fascinating plant immunity uh, signaling that holds great potential for application in plant disease management. Really, it, it was a great time. I thank my team of scientists, those who have organized such a brilliant lecture. Again, I thank you, Professor Parker, and all the participants. Uh, though it is uh, odd time in India, uh, it is a launch time, <laughs> but uh, people very eagerly um, joined here and very interestingly, they had a lot of also discussion with you. It was a very nice discussion particularly Professor Desai, he has visited your institute and he had a nice discussion and all other scientists also. I thank all of you and I thank the organizer of our institute to organize such a brilliant lecture. Thank you very much, Professor Jane. Yeah. In fact, thank you. Good part thank is you, that, you, Professor. Good part is, just to add a line, the good part is that she connected 30 years old <laughs> calcium calmodulin pathways with NRLs today. That is the best part. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. Thank you, Madam. Thank you very much. Now, uh, I will take a few minutes for the formal vote of thanks to stay with us. Uh, it's an honor to conclude today's session on the special talk on plant immunity signaling paths from the fundamental research towards application by extending hearty thanks to Professor Jane E. Parker for accepting our invitation and delivering this special talk. Madam, your talk was so fascinating that it will surely ignite our minds to think on the aspects you just presented. Uh, also, this is a remarkable opportunity for us to listen and interact with you. Thank you very much. And I hope for our stronger association in future with you. And we are grateful to have your, um, you, Professor. Now I express our sincere gratitude to our respected director, Dr. Padmini Swain, 
for presiding over today's program and for her constant support and guidance to make this program a success. Thank you, madam. I am also grateful to Dr. P. C. Rath, principal scientist and chairman of today's uh, program uh, at NRRI for planning the coordinating activities. I am thankful to Dr. Sudhamar Mandal, principal scientist and mem member secretary of this program for meticulously planning and organizing the events. I thank all the heads of the divisions and regional stations, uh, scientists, head of office, senior finance and accounts officer, WOs, and other staffs of NRRI for attending today's special talk and providing necessary support. I also express my gratitude to all the scientists and office staffs who are attending this event on virtual mode uh, from across the country. I thank all the staffs of Addis Cell and the committee members of Ajadi Kamrit Mahatsav at NRRI for making all the arrangements for successful organizing this special talk. Thank you, one and all. So uh, that's all for today's program. Uh, Director, Madam, uh, should we close here? Yeah, thank you very much. We can so, close now. Uh, Thanks, Dr. Thank you very much. Thank Professor you. Parker, thank, thank you, you once again. again. Have a good day. Stay safe. Thank you. you too. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jen. Thank you. Bye bye.